So what you're going to do for problem set two is implement a shell. So I'm going to start a terminal. So how many of you are actually used to using the terminal or a command shell? At least, at least uh, it looks like about two thirds. So, so many people are used to using a shell. So what actually happened when I started, started the shell? So what processes are involved in getting to this stage? So here I am. I'm running bash. So here's bash is one process. That's running here. What process started bash? OK, good, right. So whatever the terminal program is, and it's some program that is built into Mac, right? So the terminal created this window, right? And within that window, we're running a new process that's running bash. What created the terminal? So I did some clicking in my graphical OS. Right? So there's some graphical shell, right? The, the command shell that we're going to type into terminal, right? That's, that's a shell. The way sort of most people who aren't computer science students start programs is not by typing into shells. Right? But they're using a shell. It's just a graphic shell. So there's some graphical shell. I don't actually know what the graphical shell on the Mac is called. Does anyone know what it is? So I'm not sure what it is. Um, I'm, I'll just call it GUISH as the GUI shell. So that started terminal, which started bash. What started the GUI shell? Is that always running? Yeah. Yeah, well, something, you know, when we booted up the machine, something started this GUI shell, right? So there might have been other steps before that. Um, did you have a, another? OK, so I don't actually know if, if that probably, probably is correct. Um, so something started this, this GUI shell. And I will take your word that is launch D. And then what started launch D? Um, at some point, the kernel started all of this. Right? And there may have been more steps between those, those two. But now we've started our bash shell. And inside bash, we're going to run the shell that you'll build. Just so you know, it's really a Rust program. So I'm going to compile. The, and this is the implementation that, that Waylon built of the reference solution to problem set two. So now I'm going to run my gash shell. And I can run commands in it, just like I could in the bash shell. And we can do things like look at the processes running on our machine. So I'll, I'll do a regular PS first. So these are the ones that were started in this terminal. Sorry, these are the ones that were started by terminal. And one of those should be the one that I'm running now. Right, so terminal started many other processes. Right, we can see I've got about six different bash shells running. So I do have a bunch of other terminals. What's more interesting is look at all the processes that are running on the machine, not just the ones that started inside this parent. And we can see a long list of them. And I'll scroll, scroll up to see the, the top ones. So what do we think of this? So we've got three processes running that are all used close to 100% on my CPU. Does that make sense? How am I able to have more than one process using 100% of my CPU? How, how is the total here able to add up to more than 100? Yeah. yeah. So this is actually like each core. So I've got, I think I have eight cores. So I could get up to 800% if all of my cores were being used maximally. Not uncommon to be above 100%. Now, what would you think if you see three processes like that? Uh, so let's look at, OK. So one thing I'm going to do, I'm using the bar, right? So bar is a pipe, and it takes the out, output of this command and makes it the input of the next one. So I'm going to take the output of psdocs and put that through head. Head's just going to show me the top five lines. Yeah, so these are my three. Um, I, it's more than the top five lines. Actually, yeah, I guess it is. So this is all one line. And when it was filling up the screen, it wasn't seeing that. So what do we think of that first process that's using 98% of my CPU? It's using basically all possible cycles on the core that it's running on. So what could cause a process to use basically 100% of a core? Could it be doing anything that involves reading and writing to the disk? Yeah, so if it was doing anything like I.O., well, remember we saw the time you know, an, an I.O. operation takes is millions of times. It's either billions or millions of instructions could execute in that time. So if it was doing any I.O., 
there's no way it's using 100% of a core, because when it's waiting for the I.O. to come back, it's stuck. So what's it probably doing if it's using 100% of a core? Well, so, so each thread would be running in a separate core, right, if it's using multiple threads. So this is, looks like it's one thread running in one core. So if it's using up 100% of the core, or very close to it, right, that means it's never doing anything that gives, it, it's never idle, right? It's never waiting for anything to happen. Right? So it's using the processor completely running instructions every time it gets a chance to run an instruction. So it's either doing a lot of computation, or what's the more likely thing it's doing? Yeah. Yeah, it's more likely in some buggy infinite loop, where it's not doing anything useful, but it's running. And there's obviously a long path there, but you can see that it's Chrome that's doing this, right? So Chrome, there's a Chrome helper app that has a ton of parameters and appears to be crashed. And if I looked at the Activity monitor, I would also see that. So my top three processes are crashed versions of Chrome. So I will kill it. So, and now I should only have two of them. Um, actually, I think I killed the wrong thing. Uh, so one of the experiments I, I encourage you all to do is try killing processes on your machine. You should back things up and make sure nothing important is running before you do this. But you should try killing as many processes as you can. Four, one, six. Shouldn't kill that. Let's kill. Uh, two. Okay, so. Okay, so let's kill a few more processes. Um, and if you were closer, you could hear my fan. We'll stop making all that annoying noise. Noise. I didn't set up these crash Chrome processes just for the demo. That when I would looked at what was running. They were already there, but I didn't kill them because it seemed like it was useful to have them continue for the demo. Um, and let's look at some other things we can do in our, our shell. I'm still running in Gash, which is why all the things that I type that I expect to work because they work in Bash don't work because Gash is not quite as powerful as Bash. But it can do many of the things that we want to do in a shell. So the first thing we're going to look at is running a background process. So Let's, we'll see if um, Google is up today. So we can ping it. And by putting the ampersand, it's going to run in the background. Right, so that means that that process is running. But unlike when I run a program in the foreground, my shell is still there. So it's running in the background. I can do other things. I can do uh, start another ping. And I'm going to see the results of those two interleaved. Right, so each of those is running as a separate process. They might be running on the same core and having turns to run. They might be running on different cores. And we would need to look separately. And let's actually do that. Um, actually, so this, uh, OK. So now I've suspended Gash with Control Z. And we should be able to see what's running. So another way to look at processes is using top. The top will give you a live view of the processes that are running. This is sort of similar to what the activity manager gives you on a Mac. And I can see both of the pings are running. Now, why is ping using so little CPU? Yes. Yeah, so it's basically there's very little computation going on in ping, right? It's sending a packet on the network. It's waiting a while to get a response. When the response comes in, that's triggering an interrupt at the operating system that's going back to ping, and it's doing something and printing out that, that response. And then it's doing something else. But it's doing very little computation. We can't really tell from this if they're running on the same, same core or not. We can see one of the columns you can see here is the number of threads. So each of the pings is running one thread. Gash is running 13, which seems like more than I would have expected at this point. But uh, you'd have to look at once Once the reference solution is released, you can look at that code and figure out why it's already running 13 threads. And it's really running some threads. So for each process that it starts, it needs to run a thread to process the output that's coming from that to display it. Okay, so it's to run a process, it's starting a thread, then starting a new process inside that thread. So that's definitely why it needs, needs more than one. So let's see if my gash is still running, which it is. Right, so I use Control-Z to put, put gash in the background and get back to my bash shell. Now I'm back in, in the gash. And I'm going to use Control-C, which I think will kill those pings. Now I'm back in Gash. Um, OK, so 
what would be, a, so that doesn't really make too much sense to run those pings like that as background processes, because you just fill up the screen with text that's hard to understand. What would be a sensible process to run in the background? Any other programs that some of you might have written in the last few days that you would want to run in the background? Exactly. Yeah, so a web server you'd probably want to run in the background. So we're going to start Zepto. Should have it. And we want to run in the background. Now, when it runs, it produces a log. So we don't want to actually see those log messages in our shell. But we don't want to lose them either. So what we're going to do is redirect that log to another file. That's an I.O. redirect. And that means that the output of Zepto, its output, instead of going to standard output and appearing on the screen on the terminal here, can be stored in some other file. So we'll do that. Um, and we'll run it all in the background. So now we're going to be starting the server in the background. And instead of seeing the log messages, they're going to be written to this, this log file. And let me give it a name, log one. Oops. Uh, Oh, I spelled zip to run. OK. Oh, I need to. OK, so uh, now I'm starting, but I have an error. OK, good. So this actually makes sense. Um, can I figure out what I did wrong? So first of all, the, the error didn't go to that log file. Right. So that means it wasn't generated to standard out stream. It was generated to standard error stream, which I didn't redirect. So that's good. So I actually get to see the error message right away. So does that make sense, that error? Yeah, that's what it sounds like, right? So it's not the friendliest error message. And this is what you know, the, the Rust library code is generating, that I tried to open a port, and the error is the address is already in use. And if we had a more user-friendly version of our Zepto server, instead of Seeing the Rust error, it would generate a, a more helpful error message from that. So what I need to do is figure out um, the one that's already running. And I see that I do have one already running and kill it. Hopefully, there were no people visiting my Zepto server when I killed it. So now I should be able to start it again. Let's try. And it looks like it's running. So let's connect to it. So I'm connecting to my local host and the server there. And you'll note, I'm not see oh, gosh, that's kind of hard to see. But the visitor account is increasing. I'm not seeing anything here. But we can look at what's in the log file and see that it is logging those messages, right? So I, I'm seeing the connections, all the stuff that gets logged. What I could also do, I could use tail to that log file. All, all these things that I'm using, like grep, tail, cat, all these are just regular programs. Right? They're programs. I'm running them inside my gas shell. And now I'm running tail-f, which will keep looking at that file and updating it as it goes. I don't know if I have any files. I think this will be an invalid request. OK. Now I can kill that. I'm going to do Control-C. So what happens when I do Control-C? So I think what happens, it killed my tail. I think it didn't kill my server. Actually, it killed the server as well. It killed everything, which is not what would happen in the dash shell. So when you implement signaling, you want to think if, if you want yours to behave like this or maybe a little differently. But it killed some processes. It didn't actually kill gash. So that signal got handled by the, the gash process. And in response to it, it killed some of the processes that it had started. And I think it probably should have only killed the tail process that was the most immediate one. But it also killed the one that was running in the background. So hopefully your implementations won't do that. What are other things we can do with our shell processes that are running? If we kill the gash process, what do you think is going to happen? Let's see. I don't really know. So uh, let's try killing it. Kill it using the activity manager. OK, so see, see how many processes Chrome has? And only one is crashed now. So that's not bad. It's oh, actually two are crashed. So only about one out of every 20 Chrome processes is crashed. So 95% are good. Let's try to kill Gash. And I'm going to first quit. OK. 
and it killed it. And now we see the bash prompt. Um, interestingly, pop is still running. OK. So now my shell is really behaving strangely. This is probably not, well, this sort of makes sense, right? I killed Gash. Gash doesn't have anything in its implementation to say, when I get killed, I should kill all the processes I started. Right? This is different from terminal. Right? When you shut down terminal, or when you kill terminal, it's going to kill all the processes running inside it and give you a warning if there are processes running before you kill it. The top process that I started inside Gash is still running, but it doesn't know that it's lost control over the screen that it's running in. So now it's still running, but it's drawing updates in strange places. So you can definitely get interesting things to happen if you kill processes. I think I should probably leave that demo there before anything more interesting happens. And I will uh, remind you to get started. Well, you should already have started on problem set two. I shouldn't say get started. I should say continue uh, on problem set two. You have until, you have more than a week still to finish it, but there's quite a bit to do for problem set two. It's definitely more challenging than problem set one. And you do need to work with a teammate. So if you do not have a teammate yet, you should stay after class and find one. And I'm hoping there will be an even number of people who don't have teammates after class, and everyone will have a teammate um, before leaving class today. See if you can get interesting things to happen by killing processes. Do, do make sure to back up any important stuff you have before doing that. So if you need a teammate for problem set two still, um, come over to this part of the class and you can find a teammate.